Okay, so first let me thank the, all the organizers for the invitation and for putting together this winter school and the whole trimester under such difficult circumstances. And I'm going to speak about functional inequalities um, with focus on their um, connections to concentration of measure. So let me start with a disclaimer. So, so first of all, these are supposed to be introductory lectures. So there will be no original research here. And also, for example, for today's talk, we will consider, we will discuss mostly mathematics of the second half of the 20th century. Right? And um, another thing is that uh, uh, there are now plenty of uh, functional inequalities, which you can use to prove various types of concentration results. And I'm going to um, focus just on two of them, on the most classical ones, the Poincaré and the Lok Sobolev inequalities. And I would like to discuss them somehow in parallel. So uh, I would like to highlight the similarities and differences and uh, sometimes I will prove or sketch proofs of, of facts for just one of them, some, sometimes for both. And it may be the case that you can actually write down a general theorem which covers both cases and much more. I will not do it because first I believe that it's better to understand the, the simplest things um, at the beginning. And, and second, it would involve much more complicated formulas. So it wouldn't be a good idea for, um, uh, for, for an online talk. Okay, so let me start. So mm, my starting point will be the Gaussian concentration inequality, which uh, we already saw in Joe's lecture. So it's a result due to Borel and independently to Sudakov and Cyrilson from the mid seventies, it was on both sides of the iron curtain. And it basically tells us that uh, Lipschitz functions of um, um, standard Gaussian vectors in Rn um, admit uh, a sub-Gaussian type of bound on the probability of their deviation from the expectation. So the original formulation, the one that uh, uh, also the one that Joe presented was rather about concentration around uh, median, the median and not the expectation. Up to constants, it is equivalent. And also, the original proof uh, was uh, obtained by isoperimetric methods, and the right-hand side was slightly more precise. Uh, actually, there was this Gaussian, true Gaussian tail here, except of, instead of this um, upper bound on, on the Gaussian tail. But for most probabilistic applications, this is definitely sufficient, and inequalities of this type can be obtained by, let's say, softer methods, not, mm, not as involved as, as dealing with isoperimetry. And this form is also called the Gaussian concentration inequality. So, mm, as Joe already explained, the crucial point about this inequality is that the right hand side here does not depend on the dimension. Uh, which makes it useful in high dimensional probability and geometry or in infinite dimensional setting. So, so of course, I guess everyone here knows that this inequality had a lot of applications in many, many fields. And to let me just mention here that uh, when you evaluate it on linear functionals, then what we have here under probability, well, a linear functional on a, of a Gaussian vector is a one dimensional Gaussian variable. So we see that it is optimal. Well, this, this constant true here cannot be, cannot be improved. So our goal for, for this series of lectures will be to present uh, a general method or rather soft method um, based on functional inequalities for proving estimates of this type and related sub-exponential. Bounds. Okay, so I said that I was going to discuss the Poincaré and Lok Sobolev inequality, and they deal with the variance and the entropy. So everyone knows what the variance is, but let me put it here for comparison with entropy. And well, as for entropy, quoting von Neumann, no one really knows what it is. And this is true, at least in this sense, that entropy may mean very different things to various people. So for us, entropy will be a functional on non-negative random variables. Right? So it will be a numerical characteristic of a um, random non-negative random variable Z defined by 
this formula. Okay. And now comparing the right hand sides, we can see similarities. So both the variance and the entropy are of the form expectation of phi of z minus phi of the expectation of z for some strictly convex phi. So um, the quadratic function or x log x here. Right, so in particular, they both vanish if, if that is deterministic. And let me mention here uh, that one can consider general functionals of this type and, and inequalities for them. These are called the phi sub of inequalities or phi entropies. Uh, but for them to be useful um, probabilistically, it's not enough to assume that phi is convex. You, you need some additional, additional assumptions, but I, I will not and discuss them here. And in, in such generality, um, these functionals will not be homogeneous, whereas these two are homogeneous. Variance is clearly homogeneous of degree two. With entropy, perhaps you can have a slightly closer look, but using the properties of the logarithm, one can easily see that we get some cancellations and it, it's in fact uh, homogeneous of degree one. Okay. One more thing similar for variance and entropy is that they admit uh, variational definitions. So with variance, well, the usual definition, variational definition we think of is that it minimizes the square of the um, L2 deviation to constant random variables. But here we will be interested rather in a definition with supremum and one can give such a definition and the corresponding one for entropy. So it's all very easy, but let me let me show proofs. And OK, one, one more disclaimer. So I will very often restrict uh, proofs to the most regular cases. So here, for example, let's assume that the left-hand side are actually finite. Right? But, um, the, the general case is just some technical approximation. So, so let's start with the expression under the supremum in the first equation. And now using the fact that T is centered, we can add for free this expectation of Z because uh, once we integrate T, it, it will vanish. Right, and now we just use, well, if you wish the Young inequality or geometric arithmetic mean inequality to, to separate the factors in this product, expectation of T squares cancels and we are left with the variance. And for T equal to centered Z, we have equality. So um, this, this proves the, the first thing. For, for the entropy, by homogeneity, we can assume that uh, expectation of Z equals to one. Uh, and we have equality if T equals to Z. Okay, maybe you have to assume that Z is strictly positive, right? Uh, this, okay, I wrote here um, not, not the um, strict inequality. So, so the multiplication by minus, in, multiplication by minus infinity should be understood in the, in the usual sense. We, we could also put here T strictly positive. And then for the inequality, um, oh, let, let me maybe, pointed out once again that entropy, recall that entropy of Z is just the expectation of Z log Z minus expectation of Z log expectation of Z, which also explains this equality because under our additional assumption, the second part here vanishes, right? So, so we indeed get, get expectation of Z log Z. And for the, for the inequality, we just use this numerical inequality, which is also some sort of Young's inequality for, for other uh, convex functions, but it, it can be easily proved by putting t to the left-hand side and differentiating. And once you do it, uh, you, you will get after integration, you will get a cancellation and you will end up with um, expectation of z log z, which is the entropy because again, this, this second term vanishes for, for random variables of mu. So as you can see, this is, this is something very basic. Still, it turns out that it is very useful. Uh, philosophically, let's, let's see here. Um, the expressions under suprema 
are here it is linear in Z, here it is affine in Z. So, so these are supreme of affine functionals. So it tells us that these are convex functions on, on appropriate subspaces of, of uh, random variables. And this leads us to tensorization properties. Um, they were in a slightly different context mentioned um, also in Joe's talk. So this leads us to leads us to inequalities for random variables defined on products, product spaces. So assume that we have a product of two probability spaces and a random variable on this product. This product, we may think of it that it's um, endowed with, with the product measure here. So we have a random variable depending on two coordinates, say omega and omega prime. And we can, for example, condition it with respect to omega, right? integrate with respect to the second coordinate in the measure nu. Then we will get a random variable on x and we can calculate its variance with respect to mu. So I will often uh, write here in the subscript the measure with respect to which we calculate certain quantities. So this is one thing that we can do. Another thing is to first fix omega prime, calculate the conditional variance. Now, so now it is the variance with respect to omega and the measure mu. Then it will produce a random variable depending on omega prime, a random variable on this second space, and we can integrate this random variable. And thanks to convexity, thanks to this previous variational um, characterizations, we have an inequality going in this direction. So you can think of it as, as some Jensen's inequality or, or, or just as uh, plugging the expectation or, or the integral outside the, I mean, moving the integral outside the supreme, right? So I'm not writing the details because it's very easy and it's exactly the same for the entropy. And this gives us a very useful proposition uh, which is sometimes called the tensorization property for, for the variance and the entropy. So now assume that we have n probability spaces. Mu is the product measure on X, which is the product of, of our spaces. And we have a random variable defined on this product. Right? And we can calculate the variance or the entropy with respect to this product measure. On the other hand, we can proceed as before. And here, to make the sh formulas shorter, I, I change the notation to the probabilistic one. So I will usually write, this will be a shortcut for, for integral d mu, right? So most of the time I will skip the arguments, but here I, I would like to keep them to explain how this inequality works. So for each i, you can fix all the variables or the arguments except for the i one, and you can treat z as a random variable on, on the space xi and calculate its variance or its entropy with respect to the i measure. So this will produce a random variable on, on the big space. In fact, it will not depend on the i coordinate which has been integrated out. But then you can add up those random variables getting a random variable again on, on X, and you can take the average. Right? So it turns out that when you do something like that, then you will obtain upper bounds on the variance and on the entropy. Right? It, it looks very, very similar. And this is useful um, because as uh, in what, what Joe presented um, in, in the context of Bobkov's inequality, if we can, it turns out that if we, for some measures mu i, we can find good estimates on the variance uh, of some of a general class of random variables, for example, I don't know, smooth functions of, of some uh, Gaussian vector with um, independent Gaussian or other vector with independent coordinates, then we can immediately transfer such inequalities to, to the big vector or in terms of measure to the product measure and the product space. So we will see it, the application shortly. Okay, but let's prove it. And 
using the Fubini theorem, it is very easy to see that, uh, in fact, it, it's enough to do the case n equal to two, because then you can do some induction by, by grouping those spaces together. So let's, let's deal with the variance. Uh, define y, right? So n equals to two. So we have z, which depends on two coordinates. And y is the conditional expectation of z with respect to the second coordinate, right? So, so uh, since this we deal with product measures, so this is integration with respect to the first coordinate to the measure mu one. And the inequality that we had before tells us that the variance of y on, on the, the second space can be bounded by the average conditional variance. So now when we write the variance of z, maybe I should add here that this is the variance of z on the big space, right? And I should write perhaps here, then we have something like that with i equal one, two, and mu is the product measure and x is the product space, right? So, so then what I did here, when you combine, I, I subtracted and added the same thing. When you combine this expectation with this expression, it will cancel with this expression. And by the way, we can see that here and here we have the random variable y as, as defined above. So that in the second bracket, we actually have the variance of y which we already know that it's bounded by this expectation of variance calculated with respect to mu2, the average with respect to mu1. And in the first bracket after, well, after, uh, before the integration, sorry, we have um, the variance of z calculated with respect to mu1 with, with the second coordinate fixed, and then we integrate. So now when we have these two summons, when we put them under a single expectation, Right. One of them depends only on one variable, the other one on, on the other variable. When we put them under um, a joint expectation, then we get exactly the right hand side which, which we wanted in our tensorization inequality. Right. And then you proceed by induction. And it's, it's exactly the same for entropy. You just replace uh, this square function with um, x log x. So, so this is something, something rather elementary. Okay, so let me finally, th these were elementary, like the most basic properties of variance and entropy, but let me finally get to functional inequalities. And uh, well, they can be defined in a very general setting. So um, they can be defined on general metric spaces using some generalized gradients, or um, as Giovanni mentioned, they can be defined um, using, uh, well, in the context of, of Markov semigroups. So for the moment, I will just consider the most regular case. I will consider random vectors in Rn and uh, inequalities with respect to the usual gradient. So. I will stick to this setting for the first two lectures, and then I will briefly discuss semi-group approach in, in my first lecture. But for, for the moment, I, I want to keep it as elementary as possible. So for a random vector in Rn, we will say that it satisfies the Poincaré inequality with constant C if all the variances of smooth functions are bounded by C times the second moment of, of the gradient. And here, those double bars stand for the standard Euclidean norm. Right? And with the log Sobolev inequality, we have the same, except that instead of the variance, we have entropy of f of x squared. So the square is here to have the, uh, the same homogeneity on the left and on the right hand side. And for reasons which will become clear in a moment, instead of c, I mean, we say that it's the inequality is satisfied with constant C if we have two C here, right? But other than this two, the right-hand side here is, is the same. And just here we have the variance, here we have the entropy. Okay, so let me start with a simple proposition. The log of inequality implies the Poincaré inequality with the same constant, so this is, one reason to, um, to put these two in the definition to, to have simplified statements here. 
And I'm not going to write the exact calculations, but the idea is very easy. So you just apply this log sub of inequality to one plus epsilon f with uh, epsilon going to zero. And then, well, on the left-hand side here, you have some x log x when you use the Tyler expansion in epsilon, and then the constant and the linear parts will cancel out. And to, in the quadratic part, you, you will see the variance. And on the other hand, when you look, let me go back again. When you look here on the right-hand side, this is the gradient squared. So when you apply gradient to this function, this one will disappear. And on the right-hand side, you will have epsilon squared to see epsilon squared of epsilon squared times the expectation of the length of the gradient squared. So um, thanks to this, we can go with epsilon to zero and get the, the inequality. Okay, so um, another proposition is that if we have um, measures satisfying the Poincaré and log of inequalities. Well, so I, I define those inequalities in terms of random vectors, but of course they can be equivalently stated in terms of distributions of measures. So if we um, have um, a couple of measures which uh, satisfy such inequalities with some constant C, then the corresponding inequalities will be satisfied with the same constant by the product measure. And well, here I write that this is an immediate consequence of the tensorization, but let's see perhaps how it works for the entropy. So let's see that mu i is on, sorry for my handwriting, r to m i, right? And we have some function f on r to m one plus m n. Right into R. Right, so you can see by this tensorization, and then this is bounded by entropies with respect to mu i of f squared. And these are entropies calculated with respect to mu i, so, so we can upper bound them by something which I will denote by nabla i, which is just differentiation in direction of this r to m i, right? And so I, I want to write it because uh, I want to stress that uh, the fact, uh, it's not just the tensorization of entropy, but the fact that we are dealing all the time with the Euclidean norm, just uh, uh, those lengths of partial, partial gradients will add up to the length of the gradient square to on on the big space, right? So, so this is again something, something very easy. And now, in, in the spirit of what um, Joe um, showed us for, for Bobkov's inequality, we can prove these inequalities for um, the Gaussian measure. So um, I will denote the standard Gaussian measure on R O N. Right, this measure, of course, by gamma n, like, like in Joe's talk, and by g, the corresponding Gaussian vector. Right, and sometimes I will use this notation to denote that a vector is distributed according, according to the measure. So we have a theorem um, due to uh, Gross, um, which, uh, by the way, I, I'm not sure now if I'm using the, the final version of my slide, so I'm getting a little bit worried, uh, but I, I will comment on it in a, in a second. Uh, so um, the, uh, the standard um, Gaussian measure on, on Rn satisfies the log sub of inequality with constant one. So I was making some last minute corrections and I added in bracket here two other names, Stam and Federbush. So since I did it, well, maybe, maybe let me explain this. So Gross is definitely considered the founding father of the theory of log sub of inequalities. And as far as I know, he was the first one who in the mid seventies um, 
formulated them explicitly and uh, made an explicit connection with hypercontractive properties of semigroups. But uh, in the work in information theory due to STAM, an inequality appeared to which later turned out to be um, equivalent to the uh, log sobel inequality for Gaussian measures, but it, it was not clear at that point. And Federbush, working also in mathematical physics on hypercontractivity, had some similar statements as far as I understand, but uh, they were written somehow inside the proof. They can be read from the proof, but uh, there was no explicit connection. But in, in principle, I think that these are the three names associated with the log sobel inequality at the moment. Well, for us, it's important that it holds for the Gaussian measure. And thanks to the implication that we saw before, it also implies that the standard Gaussian measure on Rn satisfies the Poincare inequality. And here, um, well, I, I, I'm not really sure, perhaps someone in the audience knows whom to attribute this result to first. For sure, it is older than, than the uh, log sobel inequality. Okay, but let's, let's see the proof. Nash, probably. Nash probably. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, um, I will show a proof which, um, well, Michel Ledoux stated uh, in one of his talks and also in the book with Bakri and Gentil that there are at least 15 known proofs of, of the Gaussian log sobel inequality at the moment. I will present the one uh, due to Gross, and it, it is a probabilistic proof using. Uh, using tensorization and an idea which was also used by Sergei Bobkov um, in, uh, in uh, the proof of his inequality and which was uh, quite popular in, and fruitful in, in the 70s uh, where it was used I think by Nelson, Beckner also, Bonami. So we will conclude the inequality in the Gauss space from an inequality on the discrete cube. So in probabilistic terms for independent Rademacher variables. So first, by tensorization of entropy, it is enough to consider n equal to one. We don't have to do it. We can use tensorization because we will use tensorization later on the discrete cube, but for notational purposes, let's, let's start from n equal to one from the very beginning. Then let's consider a sequence of IID Rademacher variables, so symmetric plus minus one variables. And then one checks, that for any function h on a two-point space, we have the following inequality for Rademachers. And okay, I write this expectation here because, well, we have we have a random variable here, but in, in this case, you can see that it is in fact that after taking the square, it is a deterministic quantity. So this is just the difference of the values of the function. Squared. And let's take this inequality for the moment for granted. And let's observe that again by tensorization, if we have a function on the n dimensional discrete cube, so we evaluate it probabilistically, it's a function of n Rademacher, independent Rademacher variables, then thanks to tensorization of entropy, just as in the same way as we saw a few slides back it can be bounded from above by such expressions. So here we have the sum over all the coordinates and in the i-th step, we, we just look at the, let's say, discrete gradient in, in direction i. So we take the two possibilities, possible values, plus one and minus one, and, and we look at the difference, keeping the other random variables fixed. Right, so, so the idea is to start with sufficiently regular f and apply the above to, to a function h of a special type. So it's f evaluated on, on this um, CLT type quotient. Right. So let me, let me move to the next slide and denote this partial sums, the numerator by, by Sn. So we know that by the central limit theorem, Sn over square root of n converges in distribution to a Gaussian random the standard Gaussian random variable. So let's say for bounded continuous f, right, we have that the entropy of f squared is the limit of entropies of the functions evaluated on our discrete Rademacher sums. 
And now we can apply the inequality, which uh, was derived due to tensorization um, for, from the two points, the inequality on the discrete cube. And okay, let me make point out that um, thanks to the nature of, of this numerator, it is just a summation. So swapping the i-th um, um, Rademacher variable here is the same as subtracting two epsilon i from, from the numerator. So, so we can see that in fact, on, on the right hand side here, for each summand, we have the same argument here, and here we have a small argument, small perturbation of this argument, right? The epsilon i's are random signs, so they, they are uh, just plus minus ones. So assuming that f is, let's say, class C2 with compact support, and let's say using Lagrange remainder in Tyler's expansion, we can, we can get something like that. Now, when we square it, this is a nice thing here because the Rademacher variables will disappear because the square will be just one. The four will, gi will give us, together with this one half, will give us two. And the square of this first part will be the same for each summand. And we divide by one over n after squaring. So we'll get exactly what we want. And the rest of it, well, f is f prime is also bounded. So if it is easy to see that the square of this remainder and the product after summing them up will stiff, still give something which converges to zero. So appealing once again to the central limit theorem, we see that the right-hand side here converges to, to twice the second moment of the derivative, right? Derivative because we are in dimension one, and this establishes or inequality. Right. So, so this is the proof, but I should go back to the two-point inequality. So I'm not going to present the details of the proof. It's uh, in fact a nice exercise, but I would just like to convince you that, that um, it may look scary at first, but it's not as scary as it, as it looks. So denoting the values of our function just by A and B, here on the left-hand side, we have the entropy calculated on the two-point space with equal weights. And here we have this, this right-hand side, right, the discrete derivative. And one can see that the left-hand side is, does not change if we pass to absolute values, the left-hand side decreases. So we can assume that they are A and B are non-negative. In fact, by continuity that they are strictly positive and that by symmetry that B is greater than A. So for A equal to B, we have equality. And now when we differentiate in B, the above reduces to, to something like that. So you can verify if I haven't made any typos here, this should be the um, derivative of the left-hand side. And then when you denote, maybe I should write it that T equals to A over B, when you, re you re rearrange, so I, I skip the details here, you, you end up with such an inequality which should hold for T not exceeding one. But this is true again by differentiation. So we have equality at one and, and the derivative is of the right sign. So, so up to calculations, you can see that um, it, is, it is rather elementary. Okay, so, so far we have uh, seen the definition of, of the log sub of inequality and we have seen that it holds for, for the Gaussian random vectors, but uh, well, I started with concentration inequalities. So let us now see how such log sub of inequalities imply concentration. So this is a um, theorem, um, the proof of which is usually re referred to as, as the Herbst argument. So as far as I know, it was uh, communicated in a letter from Ira Herbst to, to Gross in the 70s, and it, it was unpublished under um, early 90s. Uh, but nowadays, usually one calls this theorem, um, Herbst, or, or perhaps rather the proof, Herbst's argument. Um, so it tells us that if we have a random vector which satisfies our log sub of inequality with constant c, then we have the well, let's say one-sided uh, deviation inequality of sub-Gaussian type for, for Lipschitz functions. So uh, 
the way I um, formulated the um, um, Gaussian concentration equality was two-sided. Well, of course, uh, you can just apply this inequality to f and to minus f and use the um, union bound to, to get this formulation with, with constraints to it. So um, let, let us prove this thing. And it is a very nice argument relying on a correct interpretation of this log sub inequality. So it turns out that it can be interpreted as a differential like let's say one dimensional differential inequality for the log Laplace transform of uh, our random variable. So let, let's see it, let's assume that F is smooth and let's apply the log sub of inequality to this function E to lambda F over two. So here on the left-hand side, we just have the entropy. You can see, uh, well, let, let me recall perhaps that in the log sub of inequality, we had entropy of f squared of x, x right, smaller than two, two c times the second moment of the gradient. So, uh, sorry, f of x squared, right? So after taking the square of our function, right, f is now e to lambda f over two. So after taking the square, this, this two in the denominator will, will disappear. So this is our entropy and on the right hand side we just differentiate we, we use the chain rule to, to differentiate this function and we will get such an expression and I believe my c became k right uh, mm, let's see how how it is in the sequel just for a second right so I hope, to, okay, so sorry, my C became K, so let's change the notation locally, All right? Let's assume that C equals to K, I, I apologize um, for that. Uh, and this one half here is because we had two K and uh, one half will appear from the differentiation and uh, when squared, it will give uh, one four times Two, so so it will be one half. So so later, I hope that everything will be correct. So now we assume that our function is um, our function is ellipses. So the gradient is bounded pointwise by L. So here it is L squared, and when we estimate this length of gradient by L squared and move this thing outside of the expectation, you will see the same expectation on the right-hand side as on the left-hand side, and we can divide by this. And now as some sort of a miracle happens, so probably one needs a, a couple of seconds to, to, to see it, but it turns out that the left-hand side here is the derivative of, of this expression, the derivative with respect to lambda. So I'm, I'm not going to, go over this derivation, let's just notice that lambda square appears in the denominator as it should. And when we look at this part, after canceling this expectation that we indeed have the numerator times one, which is the derivative of, of lambda. And so, so you can check that this is indeed the case. Moreover, when you look at it and use the L'Hopital rule, this converges for lambda going to zero, this converges to the expectation of f of x. So when you integrate this out from zero to lambda, let me perhaps write this down so, so you will get log expectation of lambda f of x mm. Over lambda minus the expectation of f of x, and it will be smaller than one half k l squared lambda. So after multiplying by lambda, putting this thing under the logarithm, not using the properties of the logarithm, it turns out that we have such a bound, and this is a bound on the log Laplace transform of the centered variable which we are interested in. Uh, 
And now we can use the usual trick. We can use the exponential Chebyshev inequality. So for positive lambda, the event that our centered function exceeds t is the same as the event that e to lambda times our function exceeds e to lambda t. So once we use the Chebyshev Markov inequality for this exponential function, we'll get something like that. We, we take the infimum over lambda. And now when we plug in the bound which we had on the log Laplace transform, it turns out that all we are left with is um, um, minimizing a quadratic function and well, taking lambda equal t over kl squared gives what, what we were after. So as you can see that this argument is, is really soft in, in some sense. Uh, uh, so, so this is why, why it became, became important. Okay, so let me now pass to the exponential measure. And uh, okay, I don't have too much time now. So um, let me summarize first. So, um, so far we have seen that the Gaussian measure satisfies the log Sobolev inequality and because of this also the Poincaré inequality. So in general, Poincaré is weaker, but we haven't seen two things. So first of all, we haven't seen, uh, we haven't checked if the reverse implication is not true. Perhaps Poincaré, well, it could a priori imply log Sobolev. And second, uh, if it doesn't, we, we don't know if it implies some concentration. So we will see that uh, the implication cannot be reversed. Poincaré is strictly weaker. We will see it with an example of the symmetric exponential distribution. And second, we will um, see that uh, it's uh, uh, the concentration it gives, uh, the concentration derived from the Poincaré inequality uh, is weaker than, um, than you know, sub -gauss. Okay, and. Our example here, the standard example is the symmetric exponential distribution. So it's the product of the double-sided exponential distribution on, on R. So a measure with this density in Rn. And the tails of, of this measure, for example, of a single coordinate are not sub-Gaussian. So this measure cannot satisfy um, the, the log Sobolev inequality, but we will see that it does satisfy the Poincaré inequality. And it was proved by several authors. And these are the references I have been able to locate. Okay, so, so I hope I will manage to, to do it and I will leave the concentration part into the next talk. So let's prove this. So again, by tensorization, this time for the Poincaré inequality, we can assume that we are in dimension one and then just integration by parts gives the following um, formula for functions phi, which uh, do not grow too rapidly at infinities. So, so this is the integration by part applied to the negative half line and to the positive half line. Right? We have these different signs here. So in probabilistic terms, it is like this. And for the Poincaré inequality, we can assume that the function vanishes at zero because both sides are invariant after shifting the function. And so we apply our integration by part to F squared. So, so this is the derivative that we obtain. And we just use the Cauchy-Schwarz to see that the same thing as we have on the left-hand side appears on the right-hand side, but with a different power. So now we can rearrange everything, take the square and obtain the second inequality here. Well, of course, the second moment is greater than the variance. So, so as you can see, it works like that. Okay. And now let me just announce, I, I won't have time to, to prove it um, today or unless Elizabeth allows me to take three minutes more, then, then I will prove it. 
Fine, three minutes more. Okay, so I'll try. <laughs> so, so this is the concentration coming from the Poincaré inequality. As, as, as you can see, it's not sub-Gaussian, it's sub-exponential. And it was first obtained, I think, by Gromov and Milman. The proof I'm going to present, it was on manifolds. The proof I'm going to present for, for general semi-groups is due to Ida and Struck. So it will be, again, based on, about on the local Laplace transform. So we denote this Laplace transform of f of x by this. H, and we can assume by scaling we are on our end, so we can scale both the measure and the function, right? So let's assume that uh, they are both constants are one, and then it's an exercise to check that it will translate in general to such bound. And then when you look at the variance of our functions, then it can be written as h of lambda minus h of lambda over two squared. When you evaluate bounded with the Poincaré inequality and again bound the gradient by one, you will see that for lambda small enough, we will get h of lambda on the right hand side, but with a prefactor smaller than one. So you can rearrange and obtain a bound of h of lambda in terms of h of lambda over two. And then you can iterate. So I will spare you the, the details of this iteration. What is important is that you get such an ugly looking expression. And now it's the denominator that, that looks kind of ugly, but by convexity or what is known as the Bernoulli inequality sometimes, you can, you can bound this denominator. You, you can translate all the bases of, of our powers to the same one. And it is in such a nice way, you, you apply this inequality with k equal to four to i minus one that in the exponent, you will get this mm, nice geometric series, which converges to two. And as for the numerator, uh, the same argument as before by the L'Hopital rule, it will give just ex exponent, uh, exponential function of lambda times the expectation. So, so playing with these expressions and passing to the limit m tending to infinity, we will get such a bound on the Laplace transform again. And now you use again Chebyshev's inequality. Right? But now you can optimize only over lambda between zero and two. And I didn't care to, 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 to optimize here. I just plugged in lambda equal to one. So if I haven't made any mistakes, this is, this is what we get then. Okay, and, and that's it. 